Hi, I'm Dr. Steven Niedermeyer. I am an orthopedic hand and upper extremity surgeon working in Dallas, Texas. Today we are here discussing the utilization of the 0.8 millimeter avulsion hook plate um, in the setting of distal radius fractures. Um, the most common reason to utilize the avulsion hook plate in distal radius fractures um, and is seen recreated here in our specimen are these very distal volar ulnar corner fracture fragments. A lot of times uh, these go missed preoperatively um, and you build your fixation for your distal radius fracture and then you realize that your volar ulnar corner fragment uh, remains not fixed and continues to confer instability to the carpus because there are very important intrinsic volar ligaments to the wrist that join the distal radius and the carpus. And if this fracture fragment is not secured, the carpus along with this fragment will displace volarly or toward the palm, causing persistent instability of the radiocarpal joint, necessitating revision fixation surgery. To secure the volar ulnar corner fragment in conjunction with an Acumed Aculoc II volar distal radius plate, place the avulsion hook plate first onto the fracture fragment, provisionally securing it to the distal radius, followed by then placing an Aculoc II volar distal radius plate over top of that provisional fixation, fixing your plate to the rest of the distal radius, and then securing your screws through the plate. That is typically performed when you've gotten a preoperative imaging and your, your surgeon comes in knowing this fragment is going to be of importance. And in that case, you can then work with your scrub tech on the back table, getting him or her prepared for the things that you will need in order to achieve fixation with the avulsion hook plate and your Aculoc II volar distal radius plate. What I typically like to do is identify that fracture fragment and provisionally fix it with a 0.054 K wire. So your surgeon will identify the volar lip of the distal radius, insert the K wire, using it as a joystick, reducing the fracture, and passing the wire bicortically, securing that fracture fragment first. From here, you'll, you can place your avulsion hook plate with the tines set onto the 0.054 K wire to act uh, as a stabilizer for when you secure the hook plate to bone and the distal radius plate to bone. From here, we'll then drill a 0.035 K wire through the avulsion hook plate to provisionally fix it to bone. At this point, you can place the 0.035 K wire through the most distal holes in your Aculoc II distal radius plate. Now, this may require your surgeon to extend the incision more proximally. A lot of people will like to make a small volar incision, but if you want to utilize this 0.035 K wire to position your plate and the incision is too far distal, it is difficult to fit the distal radius plate underneath all those soft tissues. So at this point, if I have made a too small incision, or if your surgeon has made a too small incision, at this point, I will extend my incision more proximally so that I can position the plate without fighting the soft tissues and adding another uh, variation of difficulty to an already difficult fracture pattern. Now I will secure the plate provisionally with two more K wires so that I remove a degree of freedom and the plate once I've confirmed that I like where it is on fluoroscopy, it will stay positioned while I'm drilling my screw holes. So much like we're using for the volar uh, lunate facet fragment, if you have a radial scaphoid fragment and you'd like to use the hook plate, you must utilize the most radial of the distal holes. From this point, I like to drill through the oblong screw hole, securing my plate to bone, further compressing the plate and the avulsion hook plate into the fracture. From here, you use a depth gauge to measure for a 3.5 millimeter cortical non-locking screw. And use your ratcheting screwdriver to insert your 3.5 millimeter cortical screw. So you can see here the plate being compressed to bone, further securing the relationship between the avulsion hook plate and the volar distal radius plate. 
At this point, you have the option you can continue to fix proximally, adding locking 3.5 screws to the shaft of the plate, or you can now move distally. This is our intraoperative PA x-ray. What you'll see here is the two tines of the avulsion plate, correct position of your Aculoc 2 distal radius plate. What you want to be sure is that your tines and your ulnar aspect of the distal portion of the volar distal radius plate are outside of your DRUJ view. At this point, You've checked on orthogonal fluoroscopy. You like the position of your hook plate. You like the position of your distal radius plate. You can, again, fill these locking screws proximally, or you can move distally. There's two options for drilling your distal screw hole. You can use the lock-in guide through your peak guide, or you can use the drop-in guide. And I'm, I'm more of a fan of the drop-in guide because you can hold it and measure off of it a little bit more easily with the laser etching on the drill and the laser markings on the drop-in guide. So you can now call for your screw or you can use the drop-in probe to measure your screw if you're unsure what the length of your screw was. To secure your avulsion hook plate and volar distal radius plate, you can utilize a distal non-locking screw or the titanium variable angle locking screw into the avulsion hook plate and the volar distal radius plate. So for this demonstration, we'll use the variable angle screw, utilizing your orange torque limiting screwdriver until you hear an audible click. From here, you take additional x-rays to make sure that the screw is of adequate length and the position of your hook plate has not changed. So here you can see good placement of the distal radius plate, the tines of the avulsion hook plate on the volar corner of the distal radius, and the plate is outside of the DRUJ. So on your lateral x-ray here, you can see adequate positioning of the volar distal radius plate and the two tines here securing that volar ulnar corner fragment on your lateral x-ray. At this point, I like to fill in the rest of my distal row. Um, what I typically will do is I will have my scrub tech and my, and my representative have already pre-measured screws based on preoperative imaging, measured and on the back table. So I will drill all of my screws in the distal row at once and then proceed with filling them all at once. At this point, we will switch to the proximal holes. You'll remove all of your provisional K-wire fixation. You remove your peak guide and take your final fluoroscopic images. You can see the two tines of the volar hook plate, adequate screw placement beneath the subchondral line of the distal radius and a center position of your volar distal radius plate. On your lateral view, you can see subchondral screw placement of your distal locking row, your styloid screws, the two tines of the avulsion hook plate, and your fixation proximally. Screws only need to be about 75% of the width of the lunate to be adequate in length. Um, there was a good biomechanical study that was done showing that only 75% of the width of the lunate need be the length of your screw to provide the same biomechanical fixation as screws longer than that.